What we're asking this afternoon is, should we be afraid of, uh, of technological unemployment coming from artificial intelligence or improved machinery or automation was the thing we, earlier, we, we, we used to talk about, and that's, that's what I'm going to answer conclusively today, and so you don't ever need to, need to worry about it again. I'm going to cure all your anxieties about technological unemployment. And as you heard, I'm an economic historian. That's my scientific field. And from the historical point of view, well, actually, there are two historical points of view. From the point of view of the actual economy, the real economy, the economy of Italy or, or the United States or England or whatever, there has never been large amounts of technological unemployment, ever. People move from jobs. The most important movement they've done is moving from agriculture to industry. Uh, in 1800, 80% of Americans li lived on farms. Still in 1900, almost a third lived on farms. Now it's 2% of the population. So there's this long movement out of farming. And you could think of that as a case of technological unemployment. After all, when you have a mechanical reaper, you know, a big lawn mowing machine, in fact, the lawnmower is an imitation of the mechanical reaper for wheat, you don't need hundreds of people with scythes cutting the wheat and binding it. When you, um, when, when, you, you, when you develop an automatic cotton picker, you don't need to hand pick the cotton crop. When you get uh, clay tile under drainage in the 1830s in England and the United States, you suddenly don't need people digging and cleaning out um, uh, drains, sort of a, a canale, as it were, in agriculture. So you think, well, the, the, the fear we have about technological unemployment is that no one will be employed. You, you, you see it often in the newspaper. People talk about, well, with artificial intelligence or automation, we'll all be standing around, I don't know, on street corners, unemployed. But that's not what happened with former farmers. If they were from, uh, from Italy, especially from the South, they moved to the United States massively. Uh, my former uh, father-in-law was Italian and, and, and came in that great wave of migrants. They move away. I have a friend, Gianni Tognolo, who was a professor before he went to Rome. He was a professor at the University of Venice. <laughs> and if he was ever at the train station in Venice, he was always being great grabbed by the guard who knew him, because everyone in Venice knows everyone else. It's a small town. They all know each other. He'd say, uh, you uh, were uh, um, um, professor, come, come help me with this Nona, who has come up from the south. I can't understand what she's saying. <laughs> she had come to see her son who had moved to the Venice area, at least, for work. So that's what happens. People move. And they change jobs. They become urban factory workers in the north of Italy instead of uh, 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 peasants, farmers in the south. 
And that's happened over and over and over again. It's the history of economic history. It's what's happened in our past. And the, the, so the, there's, the, there's movement out of industries and into other industries all the time. Now, in former times, say before 1800, there was quite a lot of stability in occupations. If your father was a shoemaker, you became a shoemaker. If your father, if your if your uh, if if your mother was a a, um, a farm wife, you were a farm wife. It just the way it was, more or less. But since 1800, essentially, in first in northwestern Europe. And, England and Holland and the new uh, the American colonies. Uh, there's, there was this tremendous increase in the rate of innovation. I mean, let me do it for you. I'll be behind the blackboard, and we go from the caves to you know modern times, and we're talking about three hundred thousand years of slow improvement, but then. Population increases and diminishing returns means that we don't really gain anything. Up to 1800, and here's, here's the present. Here's 1800, here's the caves. Here's 1800 and goes whoosh. There's this tremendous increase in income. And it spreads from Northwestern Europe to France and Germany and to um, Northern Italy especially. And so the rate of innovation increases, and therefore, the rate of new jobs rises. And the rate of ob obsolescence, uh, disappearance of the old jobs. But this, if we have a certain amount of flexibility, this works out quite well. Because on the whole, when people move, they move from, as I said, agriculture in the south to the, the assembly line of fiat in the north, and they're better off. Um, of course, any change is going to hurt someone. If they develop a, uh, I don't know, an artificial intelligence professor of economics and history to give talks like this, then instead of me, you'll have this machine. I am a professor of history and economics. Yeah, I'll pretend to be the machine. And, <laughs> and that, that'll take care of it. I'll be out of a job. But if I'm flexible, I'll go find something else to do. I'll become a journalist or, a, or, a, or, a, or probably more likely a, a, a movie actress. So I'll be on the big screen. <laughs> um, if there are roles for old women, it would work out. But so there's always been innovation, but the rate of innovation has dramatically increased in the last 200 years with an amazing result. The result has been that income per head in Italy has increased since 1800. Now hear this by a multiplier, a factor of 30, 30, not 100%, but on the order of 3,000%. You're better off than your great, 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 great grandparents by 3,000%. You say, my God, how can that be? 3,000%, can that be true? Well, look around you. Half the people in this room without modern medicine would be dead. I know I would. Um, uh, most of the people in this room in 1800, the equivalent, your ancestors couldn't read. Uh, um, couldn't read. All of you can read. Uh, there are your, um, you, you came here by machina, by, by automobile. Or you came in, in, in a taxi or indeed on a tram, for that matter. These are all miraculous innovations by the standards of 1800. And, and this goes on and on. Your food is cleaner. Your food is better. 
No, your 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 mama I know made made excellent food, but it it it, it gets better and better. Um, when you when you bought spinach spinach in the 1920s, you had to wash it for half an hour because it had sand in it, and you you'd go to the green grocers and buy spinach, but then you'd have to wash it. Now it's in a plastic. Uh, thing you don't have to wash it at all. You instantly put it into your salad, and I could go on and on about this, and I have in these books. I give many, many examples that that justifies this three thousand percent. Now, if it were true that people thrown out of work by improved techniques just stood around in the corner and didn't do anything. We wouldn't have 3,000%. Some little group of people would be richer, and most of us would be poor. But that's not how it happened. In fact, you can, if, if, if you understand the magnitude I'm talking about, this enormous magnitude of modern economic growth, you can see that the fears of automation, artificial intelligence, whatever, are apparently misplaced or a mistake. Um, the, ever since the beginning of what I call the great enrichment, which is in the, in the 1800s and then in the 1900s, the great enrichment, and I think it's fair to call it great if it's 3,000%. Ever since then, people have been worrying about unemployment caused by technological change. The, uh, uh, even the great economist, Ricardo, David Ricardo, worried about this. And economists and observers of the economy and workers themselves have been worrying about it ever since. And if it, if it was true, we'd all be poor. If it was true, there'd never be any new industries because people would be thrown out on the street by the old, in the old industries with improved techniques and a tiny group of surviving workers minding these machines might be better off, but everyone else would be worse off. But it didn't come close to happening. Marx was the hero of my youth, my extreme youth. When I was 16 or 17, I was a Marxist. And I thrilled to the idea of the reserve army of the unemployed. This is an important Marxist idea, that there's an increasing pool of unemployed labor caused by technological change. But it didn't happen. Now, if you were and Titonio Gramsci, in the 1930s, it felt like it was happening. The great increase in um, unemployment in the 1930s was terrifying, uh, uh, it, essentially worldwide, although there are exceptions like China. But uh, it was, unemployment was very high in Germany, the United States, um, for example, and, and in Italy. And it felt like the reserve army was building up, but then, then it stopped. After the war, no reserve army. Great movements of people going to new jobs and new techniques. So I'm saying to you, don't be frightened by new technology. Now look, I'm an old person, old woman. Um, I have to admit that I'm very irritated by the new technology of what I insist on calling a tape recorder. I brought with me to Italy. It's supposed to be a tape recorder that you can talk into and then it talks to your computer and makes it into printed text. Ah, very nice. But I can't figure it out. It's driving me nuts. I'm going to have to hire someone under 30 to solve it for me. So I'm, I understand this, this irritation with the tech, new technology and, it, and, it, and the spooky fear of the scary music comes on. You think that uh, 
everyone's going to be impoverished by this, and it doesn't happen. Um, people will say to me, when I make this optimistic claim, they'll say, well, but artificial intelligence is something new. And I just don't think so. Adding machines, the old kind, you know, the mechanical ones, they were artificial intelligence. People used to be employed, they were called computers, used to be employed to add up long columns of figures. This is after the invention of the adding machine, but before the invention, they, they were still called computers. And they were, they were women, masses of women adding up long columns of figures. That disappeared with the coming of the, uh, of the computer. I remember buying my first computer, not really a computer, an adding machine, electronic adding machine. And it could do what now you can do with a little teeny chip. You can do it on your, I don't know, on your watch or something smaller very easily. These machines replace our physical actions, like a steam engine, but they also replace our mental actions like an adding machine or a tape recorder. St. Thomas Aquinas, Tomas of Aquino, or Aquino, I forget where the accent is, Aquino, I guess. Aquino or Aquino? What is it? Tomas of Aquino. Aquino. He used to have a scribe in each corner, someone to write down what he was saying. You have one here, one here, one there, and one there. And he'd move around the room. He would speak to one of them. Some text. He would speak to them. He was making it up in his head. Then he then he moved to the other one because now this man had remembered re remembered the paragraph or the few sentences that Tomas had said to him, and he he'd be busy writing them down. Then he'd go to this one and do the same thing in that one and that one. And those are mental activities, the remembering of what Tomas was saying. And then by the time he had gotten back to this guy, he had finished writing down what Tomas had said, and then he moved. You see, it was a tape recorder. It was like this damn thing that I'm trying to make work. It's just so... Uh, irritates me. But still, you see, the machines substitute for both our physical actions and our mental actions. Uh, automobiles are filled with computers now, and they make judgments about all kinds of things. They now, they're, they're equipped, some of the fancier ones are equipped with warnings. If you get close to the cross the middle strip or get too close to the edge or too close to another car, they'll say, be careful, be careful, or something. So I, I think we need to stop worrying about technology. Now, you might say, well, how about all these people who got hurt? As I said, I would be hurt if the artificial professor was kind of created, and it might happen. Here's the problem. In a modern economy, like the Italian economy or the American economy, now here's this figure. I told you one number of how much we've grown per capita from 1800 to the present, factor of 30. This is astounding. Here's another astounding number. If you remember nothing from this talk, but these two numbers, you'll understand what I'm saying. In a modern economy, about 15% of the jobs in the economy vanish forever every year. 15% of the job slots disappear. Now, there are various causes of this. One is the factory or the office moves to another location. That's one way it happens. 
um, there's an improvement in technology. And what was done once with 10 people now gets done by one. Uh, there, there's a, uh, or, or, this is quite important, the enterprise that was started with 10 people fails. It turns out to be a bad idea. It can't make profit. And so it goes out of business, as it should, if it doesn't make profit. But profit is a signal of competence. It's a signal of desirability. If people are not willing to pay for a cappuccino, that cappuccino maker goes out, goes away. That job vanishes. So a dynamic economy in which progress is happening, progress is not caused by investment. It's caused by new ideas, by ingenuity, by new ways of doing things, whatever it is. It goes out of existence. It, it, uh, uh, it, um, it, if we're going to have progress, we've got to have 15% of the jobs vanish every year. Now, if that's the case, and it is, it is. If that's the case, we can't, how can I say, we can't replace the income of all of those people. They have to go find another job. Because we can't, you, you could say it this way, 15%, 30%, 45%, you know, boom, 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 up to 105%, 15 at a time. Soon there are no jobs that are old, only new jobs. And if, if what we've done is paid the people to stay where they are, not go look for another job, subsidize them to stay, then we're not going to get progress in the economy, and the poor are going to remain poor, and we don't get the factor of 30. In France, they once had a shipbuilding industry in the northwest of France, in, 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 in Normandy. And uh, when the shipbuilding industry moved to Japan or Finland, the French government, in its wisdom, subsidized the former shipbuilders to stay in the northwest of France, which many of them did. Because they had their friends, their, their companions to play a bocce or something, and they, they just stayed there for the rest of their lives. Now this is pazzo. This is insane. You, we, if, look, Donald Trump, oy, Donald Trump promised in his campaign to bring back coal mining jobs in Appalachia, in West Virginia in particular, uh, and West Virginia and Pennsylvania, um, that are never going to come back, and, and, and Kentucky, which are, are never going to come back because the changing technology has made natural gas a great deal cheaper. And natural gas is a substitute for coal. So coal mining, uh, except in big open pit mines, as in the west of the United States, in Colorado, is, is dead. Underground coal mining doesn't work. And even so-called strip mining, where you do take off the top of a mountain and take the coal out, for the coal that exists geologically in, in that part of the, in the eastern part of the United States, it's not ever going to come back. And that's one of this 15% this of lost jobs forever. In, in 2000, I hear this, this is a nice fact, 130,000 people in the United States were employed in the video industry. Movies? You know, you remember the old videos? You go to the store and get them. Now, zero people are employed in that industry. 130 people lost their jobs, the jobs they had before, forever. So there's, there's a deep um, 
fallacy here about, well, it, it, part of the problem is that people think of jobs as slots. They think of jobs as, you know, we need so many nurses, so many cab drivers, taxi drivers, so many professors, so many this, so many that, and they're, they're, this is kind of a mechanical way of looking at the job market. But you know, taxi drivers, they don't want to accept it, but taxi drivers have become obsolete in Milan. If you allowed um, Uber, there would be no taxi industry of the old sort. Now you don't, so there still is. But this is, there's, there's no permanent taxi driver necessary slot in the economy. There's no professor economics necessary slot. We're all subject to the, you could say, the risk of technological unemployment. It's 15%, so we can't afford to just be perfectly generous to people and keep them you know, in the mines, standing around in the top of the mine, the underground coal mine, not getting any coal, because, you know, the, uh, Margaret Thatcher, a long time ago, fought with the, with, with, with the coal miners in Britain. And it was a turning point in the British economy. Because by, by, by the time she came to power as the prime minister, Every ton of coal that was raised in Britain lost money. Every ton. So you bring the coal to the surface, sell it, and the amount you sold it for was lower. I mean, the amount you got, or no, to express it in the, the other way, the amount you paid to raise the coal, to get the coal, was higher than the world price of coal. So it was cheaper for Britain to import coal than to go on with the mining industry. So it closed. There, there are still some open pit mines in Britain in the northeast, but not very, very many. Our friend Matt, Matt Ridley owns one. So that's my tale. It's, 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 it's optimistic. I'm an optimist. It's more fashionable to be a pessimist. I would sell more books if my books were telling you that the sky is falling. Look, the sky is falling. Or the end of the world is near. Or uh, we're doomed by environmental change or the technological unemployment or whatever. We're doomed, we're doomed, we're doomed. For some reason, people love to read that and to hear it on TV. They really love to talk, to talk this way. And I don't know quite why they do, but they do. But I, I write optimistic books because I think the future is very good. I think if we don't, well, we said an expression in English, shoot yourself in the foot. I don't know if there's a similar Italian yes, yes. proverb. Same here. Uh, Bang. Um, if we don't shoot ourselves in the foot of, as we have done, 1914, August 1914, we took careful aim at our European feet and blew them off. Um, if, if, if we don't make mistakes like that, the future is going to be a future where the whole world will be as rich as Italy is or the United States. It's coming, you can see it in the, in the growth of China and India. I'm more optimistic about India than about China, but still they're both going to do very well. And this model of, of liberalism in the economy, alas, in China, not in politics, but liberalism in the economy, works exceptionally well. You leave people alone, well, I have a joke I make, kind of a joke. It's the bourgeois deal. 
the deal of the of the Borghese. You let me, un uh, bourgeois, you let me, you leave me alone to innovate, to invent the artificial intelligence professor. Leave me alone and I'll make you rich. In modern English, we don't have a plural you, but you have it in Italian and French and most languages. So we have to use the Southern American version, you all. We'll make you all rich if you leave me alone. And that's essentially what happened in the last two centuries. Um, so be of good cheer, as we say in old type English, be of good cheer. Don't worry about technological unemployment. Don't propose to, here, here's, here's it's from the policy point of view, what I'd say is don't subsidize people to stay in place. Help them a little bit, I suppose. The main thing is to not to obstruct their movement. As, as capital can move and does, Labor should move and does. Um, and if, if we move and we, if we're not fearful of the future and embrace innovation, the whole world will become rich. And, and okay, you might say, well, they're rich, so what? I agree. As it says in the Bible, if you, if you gain the world and lose your soul, <coughs> I'm not interested in it. I don't want to gain the world. I want to keep my soul. But in fact, people who are not worried about starving and not worried on a higher level if their children are going to be able to go to school um, are able to focus, if they wish, on higher things. The art museums will be full. The explosion of uh, human creativity creativity, when the whole world has been allowed to innovate and bring new um, resources to bear, will be just astounding. It will put 5th century Athens and the Italian Renaissance in the shade. We have a great future available to us if we will not let the gloomsters, you might say, the, the uh, people who say, oh, the world is coming to the end, we've got to stop industrialization, we've got to go back to traditional economy because it's, we lose jobs, it's the end of the world. If we can prevent those people from stopping us, the world is going to be much better than it is now. <clears throat>